Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at the, in Milpitas at an interesting event. It's called the Auto Tech Council Innovation in Motion Mapping and Navigation Event. So a lot of talk about autonomous vehicles. So it, there's a lot of elements to autonomous vehicles. This is just one small piece of it, and it's about mapping and navigation. And we're excited to have with us our first guest to kind of give us the background of this whole situation, just Derek Curtin, and he's the founder and chairman of the Auto Tech Council. So first off, Derek, welcome. Thank you very much, good to be here. Absolutely, so for the folks that aren't familiar, what is the Auto Tech Council? Auto Tech Council is a sort of a club uh, based in Silicon Valley, where we have gathered together some of the industry's largest OEMs. And OEMs mean car makers you know of, like right, Ford or right. Toyota, or Renault from France and a variety of other ones. They have offices here in Silicon Valley. Right, and right. their job is to find innovation, find that Silicon Valley spark and take it back and get it into cars eventually. And uh, so what we are able to do is gather them up, put them in a club, and route a whole bunch of Silicon Valley startups and startups from other places too, in front of them in a sort of parade and say, these are some of the interesting technologies of the month. So did they reach out for you? Did you see an opportunity? Because obviously they've all got the, the innovation centers here. We were at the Ford launch of their innovation center. You see the, the taglines all around. It was there too, Down yeah. Palo Alto and, and, and up and down the peninsula. Yeah. So, you know, they're all here. So was this something that they really needed an assist with? Is something an opportunity you saw? Or was it, did it come from more the technology side to say, we need an avenue in to go talk to yeah. Raja Ford? Well, it's certainly true that uh, they came on their own. So they spotted Silicon Valley, said, this is now relevant to us. Where historically, we were able to do our own R&D, build our stuff in Detroit or in Japan or whatever the case is. All of a sudden, these Silicon Valley technologies are increasingly relevant to us. And in fact, disruptive to us. We better get our finger on that pulse. And they came here of their own. Uh, at the time, we were already running something called the Telecom Council of Silicon Valley, where we're doing a similar thing for phone companies here. Uh, so we had the structure in place that we needed to translate that into the automotive industry and meet all those guys and say, listen, we can help you. We're going to be a great tool in your toolkit to work the valley. Okay, and then specifically, what types of activities do you do with them to execute the vision? You know, it's interesting. When we launched this about five years ago, we were thinking, well, we have telecommunication background. We don't have the automotive skills, but we have the organizational skills. Uh, what turned out to be the case is they're not coming here here, the car makers and the tier one vendors that sell to them, they're not coming here to study brake pad material science and things right, like that. Right. They're coming to Silicon Valley to find the same stuff the phone companies did years ago, Silicon Valley stuff. You know, how does Facebook work in a car? How do all these sensors that we have in phones relate to automotive industry? Uh, accelerometers are now much cheaper because of reaching economies of scale on phones. So how do we use those more effectively? Hey, GPS has you know, reached scale economies. How do we put more GPS in cars? How do we drive mapping solutions? All of these things you'll, you'll see you know, sound very familiar. Right. Right, from right. that smartphone industry. And in fact, the thing that disrupts them, the thing that they're here for, that brought them here you know, out of, out of defensive uh, need to be here, is the fact that the smartphone itself was that disruptive factor inside the car. Right, right. So you have events like today. So give mm -hmm. us a little story. What's the today, uh, today's event? It's called the Mapping and Navigation Event. Mm -hmm. What are people that, who are not here, what's, what's happening? Well, so every now and then we pick a theme that's really relevant or interesting. So today is mapping and navigations. Actually, specifically today is high definition mapping and uh, sensors. And so there's been a battle in the automotive industry for the autonomous driving space. Hey, what will control an autonomous car? Will it be using a, a map that's stored in memory on board the car? It knows what the world looked like when they mapped it six months ago, say, right. and it follows along a pre-programmed route inside of that world, uh, that 3D model world. Or is it a car more like what the Tesla is currently doing where it has a range of sensors on it and the sensors don't know anything about the world around the corner. They only know what they're sensing right around them and they drive within that environment. So there's two competing ways of modeling a 3D world around an autonomous car. And I think you know, there was a battle looking backwards, which one is going to win? And I think the industry has come to terms with the fact the answer is both, both more right, everything. Right, right. And so today we're talking about both and how do we fuse those two and make better self-driving vehicles. So for the outsider looking in, right, I'm sure they go, wait, the mapping wars are over, you know, Google Maps, what, what else is there, right. right? But then I see we've got Tom, Tom and me, a bunch of names that we've seen, yeah. you know, kind of pre, pre Google Maps and you know, shame on me, I said the same thing when Google came out with the search engine. I'm like, search yeah. engine wars are over, who's Google? Right. So it shows you what I know. Well, ultimately I'm, I'm, but, I'm uh, way ahead But it's you. interesting, there's a lot yeah. of different angles to this beyond just the Google map that yeah. you get on your phone. Well, I think MapQuest won everything. What are you doing? You moved on from MapQuest, <laughs> you printed out, you're good to go, right? Well, that's My the- My still prints those out. Yeah, some, Sorry, there's people on. printing those out somewhere, <laughs> burning through paper. Listen, the, the upshot is that you, you, that MapQuest is an interesting starting point. For, I mean, first it's these, these maps, folding maps we have in our car. That's the best thing we have. Then we moved to uh, MapQuest era and $5,000 sat navs in some cars. And then you jumped forward to where Google had kind of dominated. They offered it for free, kicked, you know, all, that was the disruptive factor. One of the things where people use their smartphones in the car 
car instead of paying five thousand dollars for that car sat nav. And that was a long-running error that we have in very recent memory. But the fact of the matter is when you talk about self-driving cars or autonomous vehicles, now you need a much higher level of detail than turn right in, in uh, 400 feet. Right, that, that's, right. that's great for a human who's driving the car, but for a computer driving the car, you need to know turn right in 400.0005 feet and adjust one quarter inch to the left, please. So the level of detail required is much higher. And so companies like TomTom, Tom, like a uh, uh, variety of them that, that are making more high-level maps, uh, Nokia's former company called Here is doing a good job, and then lots of car makers, lots of startups, and there's crowdsource mapping out there as well. And the idea is how do we get incredibly granular, high-detail maps that we can push into a car so that it has that reference of a 3D world that is extremely accurate. And then the next problem is, oh, how do we keep those things up to date? Because when we mapped, when, when a car uh, from, they say, Nokia here, here is the name of the company now, drives down a street, does a very high-level resolution map with all the equipment you see on some of these cars, uh, except for there was a construction zone when they mapped it, and the construction zone is now gone. Right, How do right. we update these things? So these are very important questions, and you want to have the, the answers correct and in the car stored well for that car to self-drive. And once again, we get back to something we mentioned just two minutes ago. The answer is sensor fusion. It's a map, uh, it's a mix of high-level map you've got in the car, and what the sensors are telling you in real time. Right. So the sensors are now being used for what's going on right now. And the maps are, give me a high level of detail from six months ago when, when this road was driven. Yeah, it's interesting, back in the day, right, when you had to have the CD for your onboard mapping yeah. system, you had to keep that thing updated, and you could actually get to the edge of the CD, it didn't work anymore. <laughs> yeah, so the world and is the flat. Thing, I don't know, are they covering it here too, which feeds into this is kind of the whole, all the optical sensors, because there's kind of the LiDAR mm -hmm. school of thought, and then there's the, the, the biopic yep. um, camera school right. of thought, and, and again, the answer's probably both, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> and that's, a, you know, that's, there's all these neat little battles shaping up in the industry, and that's one of them for sure, which is LiDAR versus everything else. LiDAR is the gold standard, for building, I keep saying, a 3D model. And that's basically, uh, you know, a computer sees the world differently than you or I. You or I look out a window and we build a 3D model of what we're looking at. How does a computer do it? So there's a variety of ways you can do it. One is using uh, LiDAR sensors, which spin around. Uh, the biggest company in this space is called Velodyne, been doing it for years for defense and aviation. Spin around pointing laser lasers and you know, waiting for the signal to come back. So you basically use a reflected signal back, and the time difference it takes to build those back, it builds a 3D model of the uh, objects around that particular sensor. Right. That is the gold standard for precision. The problem is it's also bloody expensive. So the car makers say, that's really nice, but I can't put four $8,000 sensors on each corner of a car and get it to market at some price that a consumer is willing to pay. So Until every car has one, and then you get the mobile phone effect, right? Yeah, well, the, <laughs> but the economies of scale at $8,000, we're looking at going, that's a little tough. So there's a lot of startups now saying, listen, we've got a new version of LiDAR that's solid state. It's not a spinning thing. Point. It's actually a, a silicon chip with our, our uh, MEMS and stuff on it right. that are doing this without the moving parts. And we can drop the price down to $200, maybe $100 in the future in scale. That starts being interesting. That's $400 if you put it in all, all four corners of the car. But there's also, also other people saying, listen, cameras are cheap and readily available. So you look at a company like NVIDIA that has very fast GPUs saying, listen, our GPUs are able to suck in data from up to 12 cameras at a time. And with those different stereoscopic views, those different angle views, we can build a 3D model from cheap cameras. So there's competing ideas on how you build a model of the world. And then there's companies like Bosch saying, well, we're strong in car and, ra and uh, radar. And we can actually refine our radar more and more and get 3D models from radar. It's not the good resolution that LiDAR has, right, which is right, the laser sensing. Right. So there's all these different uh, sensors. And I think there the answer is not all of them because cost comes into play. Mm. So a car maker has to choose, well, we're gonna use cameras and radar, or we're gonna use LiDAR and high definition maps. So they're gonna pick from all of these different things that are used to build a high, high definition 3D model of the world around the car. Cost effective uh, and, and successful and robust, can handle a few of the sensors being covered by snow, hopefully, and still provide a good idea of the world around them and safety. And um, so they're gonna fuse these together and then let their their autonomous driving intelligence ride on top of that 3D model and drive the car. Right, so it's interesting you brought up NVIDIA and, and what's what's really fun, I think, about the autonomous vehicle and self-driving cars and the advances is it really plays off the kind of Moore's Law's impact on the three tillers of, yep. of compute, right? Massive compute power to take the data from these sensors, yep. massive amounts of data, whether it's in the pre-programmed map, whether you're pulling it off the sensors, you're pulling it off a GPS, Lord knows where, Wi-Fi, 
Wi-Fi waypoints. I'm sure they're pulling all kinds of stuff. Um, and then, of course, you know, storage. You got to put that stuff. The networking. You got to worry about latency. Is it on the edge? Is it not on the edge? Yep. So there's really an interesting combination of technologies all bring to bear on how successfully your car navigates that exit ramp. You're spot on, and that's and you're absolutely right. And that's one of the reasons I'm really bullish on self-driving cars a lot more than uh, than the general industry analyst is. And you mentioned Moore's law, and Nvidia is taking advantage of that with their GPUs. So let's wrap everything you said to, uh, into kind of a big answer. Big data and more and more data. Yes, that's a huge factor in cars. Not only are cars going to take advantage of more and more data, high definition maps are way more data than the MapQuest maps we printed out. So that's a massive amount of data the car needs to use. But then on the flip side, the car is producing massive amounts of data. I just talked about a whole range of sensors. I talked LiDAR, radar, cameras, et cetera, et cetera. That's producing data. And then there's all the telemetrics uh, data. How's the car running? How's the engine performing? All those things. Uh, car makers want that data. So there's massive amounts of data needing to flow both ways. Now you can do that at night over Wi-Fi cheaply. You can do it over an LTE. And we're looking at 5G radio standards being able to enable more transfer of data between the cars and the cloud. So that's ma incredibly important. Cloud data and then cloud analytics on top of that. Okay, now that we've got all this data from right, the car, right. uh, what do we do with it? Uh, we know, for example, that Tesla uses that data sucked out of cars to do their fleet driving, their fleet learning. So instead of teaching the cars how to drive from a programmer saying, if you see this, do that, they're they're taking the information out of the cars and saying, what are the situation these cars are seeing? How did our autonomous circuitry suggest the car responds? And how did the user override or control the car in that point? And then they can compare human driving with their algorithms and tweak their algorithms based on all that uh, fleet driving. So there's a massive advantage in sucking data out of cars, massive advantage in pushing data to cars. And you know we're here at uh, Kingston SanDisk right now today, so storage is interesting as well. Storage in the car, Increasingly important for these big amount of data right. and fast storage as well. High definition maps are beefy, beefy maps. So what do you do? Do you have that in the cloud and constantly stream it down to the car? What if you drive through a tunnel or you go out of cellular signal? So it makes sense to have that map data, at least for the region you're in, stored locally on the car in easily retrievable flash memory. That's dropping in price as well. All right. So lo loop in the last thing about your, that was a loaded question, by the way, and I loved it. <laughs> And this is the thing I love. This is why I'm bullish and more crazy than anybody else about the self-driving car space. You mentioned Moore's Law. I find Moore's Law exciting. It used to not be relevant to the automotive industry. They used to build, you know, like I said, we talked about, you know, I talked briefly about brake pad technology and material science. Like what kind of asbestos do we use and how do, right, we, right. how do we dissipate the heat more quickly? That's science, physics, important R&D. It does not take advantage of Moore's Law. So cars have been moving along with uh, laws of thermodynamics, uh, getting more miles per gallon. Great stuff out of Detroit, out of Tokyo, out of Europe, out of Munich. But Moore's Law, not entirely relevant. All of a sudden, since very recently, Moore's Law is starting to apply to cars. So they've always had ECU computers, but they're getting more compute put in the car. Tesla has uh, the NVIDIA processors built into the car. Many cars having stronger central compute systems put in. Okay, so all of a sudden now, Moore's Law is making cars more able to do uh, the things that they, we need them to do. If we're talking about autonomous vehicles, couldn't happen without a huge central processing inside of cars. So Moore's Law applying now what it did before. So cars will move quicker than we thought. Next important point is that there's other, there's other exponential laws in, in technology. If people look up these other cool things, Kreider's Law. So Kreider's Law is a law uh, about storage and the rapidly expanding um, performance of storage. So for each dollar spend, how many megabytes or gigabytes of storage do you get? Well, guess what? Turns out that's also exponential. And your question talked about, isn't big data important? Sure it is. That's why we can put so much into the cloud and so much locally into the car. Huge Kreider's Law. Next one is Metcalf's Law. Metcalf's Law is a law of networking. Uh, and it states, basically, in its roughest form, the value of a network is value to the square of the number of nodes in that network. So if I connect my car, great, that's, that's awesome, but who does it talk to? Nobody. You connect your car, and now we can have two cars that can talk together and provide some element of car-to-car -car communications and some, some safety elements. Tell me the network is now connected, and I have a smart city. All of a sudden, the value keeps shooting up and up and up. So all of these things are exponential factors, and they're all of a sudden at play in the automotive industry. So anybody who looks back in the past and says, well, you know, the pace of uh, innovation here has been pretty steep. It's been like this. I expect in the future it will carry on, and in 10 years we'll have self-driving cars. You can't look back at the slope of the curve right, and right. think that's the slope going forward, especially with these exponential laws at play. So the slope ahead is distinctly steeper. Distinctly steeper. And you left out my favorite law, which is 
Zamara's law, which is, you know, we underestimate in the short term or mm -hmm. overestimate in the short term and, and underestimate in the long term. That's and, all about that and, slope. Uh, it's all about the slope. So, Derek, we could go on for probably like an hour and a half. I know half, I could. But, but you got to go. <laughs> you got to go MC your event. So yeah. thanks for taking a minute out of your busy day. Yeah. Really enjoyed the conversation and uh, look forward to our next one. My pleasure. Thanks. All right. Jeff Frick here uh, with the Cube. We're at the uh, Western Digital Headquarters in Milpitas at the Auto Tech Council, Innovation in Motion, Mapping and Navigation Event. Thanks for watching.